in Murfreesboro is my colleague uh, Nathan Johanny, and Nathan is a small farms educator uh, in, down in Murfreesboro. Nathan also grows pumpkins commercially himself, so he's really good at this, this topic. Um, we have on campus, the first speaker is going to be Dr. Rick Weinzerill, and uh, Rick is a, 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 an entomologist, and uh, we work extensively with Rick and the small farms team uh, uh, throughout the year, and glad to have uh, Rick on here. Okay, uh, good morning all. Uh, let's go ahead with this. Um, I'm going to talk to you about the major insect pests of pumpkins and ways to manage them, uh, which starts with recognizing them. And the pests in pumpkins are just part of the overall group of pests that are in cucurbit crops as a whole. Uh, the ones that are most important are striped and spotted cucumber beetles, squash bugs, squash vine borer, aphids and pumpkins. Uh, we rarely see white flies, although we do see them on uh, cucumbers in high tunnels as we extend into the fall. Uh, we rarely see mites on pumpkins, although we do on cucumbers. And seed corn maggot and wireworm can show up sporadically anywhere. And I'm just going to remind you, if you think you've seen or heard of these things in a crop before, the ones that aren't in red we won't actually cover today, just because uh, we have a limited time to talk about overall problems in general. Um, so, quick overview of who the insects are. We'll talk a bit about insecticides, and then we'll come back to each insect and deal with uh, management recommendations. Uh, striped and spotted cucumber beetles uh, look quite a bit alike, uh, and their names tell you the difference in their appearance. Um, both of them survive the winter in the adult stage. They become active in the spring. Sometimes it seems like they become active the day that you put uh, some cucurbit plant in the ground as a transplant or that it emerges as a seedling. It seems to be the day they become active. Um, they are most damaging to cucumbers and muskmelons because they carry in their system through the winter a pathogen that they pick up on infected plants in the summer and fall before, and that bacterial pathogen causes the disease as bacterial wilt. It's mostly a problem in cucumbers and muskmelons. Some jack-o'-lantern pumpkins are susceptible to bacterial wilt, um, and you have to sort of have to pay a little attention to what the uh, seed catalogs say about resistance or susceptibility. In southern Illinois, you're typically going to see two generations of these beetles per year, uh, meaning they'll cycle through to produce another round of adults uh, so that there are two full generations. In Galesburg, usually there'd be only one. And overall, you're going to control them by insecticides, a little bit by exclusion if you're an organic grower, and trap crops do a little bit of good, but not a lot. Um, Squash bug would be coming along next, along with squash vine borer. This is another insect that survives the winter as an adult. For most of Illinois, we'd say there's just one generation per year. They become active sort of early to midsummer. You'd typically say mid to late June in the far south and mid to late July in the far northern part of the state. Um, they feed and they lay egg masses on squash and pumpkins. You can see what the egg masses look like in the picture on the left. They usually, a uh, little more often than not, will be on the underside of the leaf, and they'll be right where the vein, uh, the lateral veins come off the mid vein. So they'll be packed in that little uh, angle between the two veins. Um, Pretty much they are a problem because they feed so much on plants. They remove plant fluids, and they reduce vigor and yield. Um, they do transmit a pathogen called yellow vine disease. It's a bacterial disease. And you see what it looks like here. It's a little bit like uh, bacterial wilt in its, its general appearance, but vines don't go down quite so fast and simply die immediately like they do with bacterial wilt. And actually, we haven't seen much yellow vine in Illinois. Um, it was sort of first discussed maybe 10, 12 years ago, and we've been paying attention since then, and it shows up sporadically, but not very commonly. Much more common in the Southern Plains in Kansas and Oklahoma. Third insect would be squash vine borer. 
this is a moth. It doesn't look all that much like one in the picture on the upper right. Uh, it's called a clear wing moth, and if you actually see that moth flying, it looks more like a sort of orange and black wasp, and it does fly during the daytime, unlike most moths. It lays eggs, and the larva is a caterpillar. It uh, doesn't have any hairs or spines on it, but it's a caterpillar that tunnels into the base of vines and hollows them out. You can see what that looks like in the lower left. Um, in this case, those larvae in the late season will pupate with a really, really fine silken cocoon around them. They'll pass the winter in that stage, and they emerge from that uh, pupal stage as moths, typically in sort of uh, early to mid-summer. Um, we'd say somewhere between early June and early July, depending on where we are, but that continues over a period of a few weeks. They don't all come out at one time. And then the last of the insects that we'll actually talk about with any detail are, as far as pests, are the aphids. Uh, mostly the aphid that shows up and colonizes pumpkins is something called cotton melon aphid. Uh, it is a pest of cotton in the south. It is a pest of all the cucurbits as we move into the Midwest. Generally speaking, these are insects that have a lot of natural enemies. They have a lot of little parasitic wasps that attack them. They're, they're fed on by lady beetles, both as adults and larvae. And we usually see more problems with aphids in late summer after people have made a number of sprays to control cucumber beetles, squash bug, and vine borer, and maybe made sprays they didn't need as well. And you keep killing the natural enemies, and so the aphids go uncontrolled by them and build up. And what you'll see at the late part of the season is the aphids actually on the pumpkins, but also on the undersides of leaves above the fruit. And aphids secrete all this highly uh, sugary material uh, out their back ends. They feed on a lot of plant sap and poop it out the back end. And it's rather uh, misnamed and called honeydew. Well, that honeydew secretion that's so high in sugar then lands on the plant or lands on the fruit, makes it sticky and shiny, and then you get this sooty mold growth on that sugary substance, and that's what gives you the black color there. Makes those pumpkins harder to sell if you're letting people pick up jack-o'-lantern pumpkins in the field. Just a quick overview, we'll do conventional pesticides and then organic pesticides. Uh, there are different groups of insecticides labeled for use on pumpkins. They include organophosphates, like diazinon and malathion, carbamates, and 7 or 7XLR is the one that's commonly used. Pyrethroids, such as Brigade now is the modern name for what was once called Capture. Brigade, Mustang Max, and Warrior are among the best uh, for control of certain pests. Bathroid would probably fit in that group. The others that are in black under the term pyrethroids are a little less commonly used or a little less effective. Uh, there are a number of neonicotinoid insecticides. Uh, Admire Pro can be used as a soil drench to come up into plants for systemic control of above ground plants. Same thing for thiamethoxam as Actera or Platinum, but it's also used as a seed treatment. And so a number of companies will sell cucurbit crops where the seed is treated with this product called Farmore, and it, in, it contains the neonicotinoid thiamethoxam. And that's going to be important when we get to the end and we talk about bees. The avermectins and spinosins don't have a lot of uses in pumpkins. They just don't have that many target pests. They're labeled in those crops, but they aren't the ones you'd usually use. And then there's that uh, really descriptive category at the lower right called others. Uh, lots of different kinds of chemistries. Acromite and oberon are really good miticides in cucumbers and melons. Uh, belief and fulfill are good aphid killers in pumpkins. So some of you with larger acreages of pumpkins and you truly are uh, having troubles with aphids, you're growing conventionally, belief and fulfill are good aphid control uh, insecticides. Hey, so, Rick. Yes. Rick, 
a question for you. A lot of people writing things down. Can you reference a, a, a good uh, reference uh, material that they can use? Would that be the Midwest Vegetable Production Guide if they wanted some more Yes, it is. Answers? In fact, when we get to the end of this or toward the end, I'm going to show you the link to that. But you are right uh, for everybody who can hear it clearly. If you were to just Google the words Midwest Vegetable Production Guide, it uh, includes variety, weed control, disease control, insect control recommendations for all the common vegetable crops. But I'll show you a link to that Thank later. You. Thank you. Okay. Um, for organic growers, not all of these are uh, OMRI approved. Rotenone, for example, would not be. Uh, Bacillus thuringiensis is a good caterpillar killer if something feeds on foliage but we don't have a caterpillar pest that feeds on foliage in, in the pumpkins, so it's very rarely used. Neem might be chosen for aphid control. Pyrethrins might be chosen for squash bug or cucumber beetle control. Kaolin is fairly widely used as a product called Surround uh, in organic production to try to slow down cucumber beetles especially and soaps such as Impede would be used uh, for aphid control. Requires very, very good coverage, uh, but it can work. And Trust is a very good organic uh, insecticide. It's just that we don't happen to have pests and pumpkins uh, that it's really effective on. And cryolite and diatomaceous earth are abrasives. Uh, they can work in some cases, but generally speaking, as we look at these crops grow and get larger, um, we don't have pests on pumpkins that are very susceptible to either cryolite or diatomaceous earth. So kaolin and soaps, neem and pyrethrins uh, would be the products that might be of choice for organic growers when you need them. Now, let me back up and clearly say, yeah, uh, the first things you're going to do is practice good crop rotations. You're going to use cover crops that help provide tilth and provide uh, the kind of habitat that helps natural enemies survive. But in fact, some of the creatures we have in, in pumpkins, um, those typical good production practices um, don't control as well as you'd like to, and so you may need, in fact, to use some of the OMRI registered products or other insecticides if you're not an organic grower. Um, what are these things effective against? Let's just do a brief rundown. Seven or Carbaryl is probably a very good product against striped and spotted cucumber beetles. It's fairly good against squash vine borer, and those would be the two things you might use it for in pumpkins. Um, if you use seven, I would say, please, in pumpkins, buy nothing but the product that's called 7XLR Plus, it's much less likely to kill bees. It's just as effective against anything that 7 is effective against, and so it's a much better choice. The wettable powder formulations are especially toxic to bees. Uh, even if you spray them at times when bees are not active, they present a hazard later on, and that's not true with 7XLR Plus. If you can apply it when the bees are not actively foraging, you really won't get much of any bee kill out of it. Um, 7XLR Plus is not effective against aphid, squash bug, or in the other cucurbits, it's not effective against mites. And in fact, where we spray it a lot, we kill natural enemies of aphids and mites, and we get even more aphids and mites. The pyrethroids are effective against cucumber beetles and squash vine borer, um, leaf hoppers, and some of the other cucurbits. These two are highly toxic to bees. If you use liquid formulations of them, you spray at times when bees are not active and flowers are not open, you can actually use them safely. But if you apply them when bees are foraging, you're going to kill the bees that are coming to the field. Um, the ones that are available, Brigade, Mustang Max, and Warrior are probably the best three, but Batroid as well against squash bug. Against other insects, the pyrethroids pretty well work the same no matter which ones you choose. But when it comes to squash bug, these four would be better than any of the older or other ones, like permethrin or pounce or the old ones, and they just don't work as well. For aphid control, um, two things. Some of you know aphids are virus vectors for the cucurbits. 
you can't control aphids in your field and do a good job of controlling virus. Um, and oftentimes aphid controlled is dependent on not spraying when you don't need to for everything else. So start with that idea. If you do have to control aphids, uh, Brigade has on its label aphids, but I've seen fields sprayed with Brigade weekly and aphid outbreaks just become horrendous. So yeah, you might want to not believe that part of the label too much. Malathion is an old product that works. Uh, problem is you need really, really good coverage because it's not systemic. And the same thing would be true for organic growers who would use insecticidal soaps or neem. They can be reasonably effective against aphids, but you really have to get good coverage. So lots of water and lots of air to move the stuff uh, to the undersides of foliage. Actera is sold as platinum for soil use, or excuse me, Actera is thiamethoxam. It's the one that's used as a foliar spray. Platinum is one that can be used in the soil for systemic uptake. But the ones you use in the soil are providing uptake early in the season, and that's not when the aphid problems occur. So Actera can be valuable. However, it is a bee killer, uh, worse than most of the others. And so really, if you have a specialty need for aphid control in pumpkins, you end up trying to buy one of these products called Belief or Fulfill. And they are fairly expensive on a per ounce basis. You use a tiny bit of them. Uh, but you have to have a fair bit of pumpkin acreage before you're going to invest in a small container of these because they're pretty spendy. Um, Cucumber beetle control. Let's go back then and say, all right, we've got this group of pesticides. We've got this group of insects. What can you do, pesticides or otherwise, to control them? Well, for cucumber beetle, if you do use floating row covers for exclusion early in the season, you can keep beetles off the plants when they are very small. And that lets you escape the early spring inoculation of plants with bacterial wilt. And that's a good step. So if you're growing organically, floating row covers early on is a real good idea. If you're not growing organically, floating row covers can still be a really good idea, but you do have another option. You can use a systemic product of some kind. Admire Pro and Platinum are applied to the soil or to transplants in trays. You have to handle them appropriately. But these products are also available if you're direct seeding pumpkins, as many people are, but not everybody. They are available, uh, asystemic is, in the form of this far more seed treatment. And then if you, after you've used it or not used it, when the row covers come off, if beetles are there, your choice is 7XLR or pyrethroids if you're a conventional grower, and it's surround or pyrethrins if you are an organic grower. Um, how do these systemics work? This is no-till pumpkin production into uh, cereal rye, and it's strip-tilled, and you could either use treated seed or you could use admire or platinum as a soil drench at the time you're uh, making these applications or a soil application at the time you're planting. Um, they come up into the foliage, including right away into the cotyledons, and they leave an insecticide in the foliage that's going to kill uh, cucumber beetles that feed on it. Um, so this far more seed treatment is actually one that has fungicides in it to prevent damping off um, and an insecticide uh, to control the cucumber beetles. It doesn't have anything in it that controls rodents. So if you're losing a lot of seed to voles and other little furry creatures that like those winter cover crops, um, that's a little harder not to crack. Um, how long do they work? We've done some of this work. People in Indiana and Ohio have as well. We've used the seed treatments or we've used the soil drenches. You go out and collect leaves at various stages uh, after the plants emerge. So we'd collect cotyledons or we'd collect first true leaf or second true leaf pluck those leaves, put them in a container, collect beetles from other fields where there's no treatments, put them in the containers on the leaves and see how many live or die. And pretty much the result from this everywhere is you get two to three weeks of control uh, where you've used seed treatments or whether you've used the soil applications of these systemic insecticides. The cotyledons remain toxic for a little longer than everything else. 
and that's not bad because the beetles do like to feed on them. Uh, if it gets really dry right after everything emerges and then you get a rain 10 days later, uh, you can actually get a little flush of this stuff into foliage and it works a little better again. But pretty much you'd think two to three weeks of control after you apply the product as a transplant drench or after the seedlings come out of the ground. Um, Celeste Welty is uh, an entomologist at Ohio State with a job similar to mine and she did some comparisons for the seed treatments and the soil applied admire product and pretty much said uh, you get the same degree of effectiveness regardless of which you choose and the seed treatment's a lot easier uh, as a farmer to use because you buy the treated seed. It costs less. Uh, the thing that you don't get out of it is if you use uh, treated seed to produce your transplants and you transplant them two weeks after they popped out of the ground in your trays or popped out of the mix in your trays, you pretty well lost that period of effectiveness by the time you put the transplants out in the field. Uh, so they don't really work in the same way. Um, all right, you've done or not done anything as far as using a systemic insecticide. Uh, you've maybe used or not used row covers to keep the beetles off the plants. Uh, whenever either of those treatments ends, either the two or three weeks after emergence or the row covers come off because you need pollination, pretty much in muskmelons and cucumbers you don't uh, tolerate any beetles to speak of because they are vectors of bacterial wilt. And it all depends on how bad wilt would have been around you the year before. But in watermelons and squash and pumpkins included, unless you have something that is susceptible to bacterial wilt, you take a few more beetles. You don't have to spray to keep plants completely free of beetles. Uh, you're simply trying to uh, spray if they're abundant enough to reduce growth and yield. So that number is the threshold that you'd use. You could choose 7XLR or these pyrethroids, spray when the bees aren't active, and you'll accomplish what you want. If you spray too often, you spray when the bees are active, you reduce pollination, and some of these simply reduce yield a little bit. If you're spraying every seven days, whether you need to or not, that's not a good practice. Uh, it's likely to cause problems. Remember, as we go through the summer, you're going to see another insect on these plants uh, that looks a lot like uh, striped cucumber beetle. You're going to see the insect on the lower right. It's western corn rootworm. And across the northern part of the state, especially northern half or two-thirds, western corn rootworm beetles on pumpkin flowers in, the, in August and early September can be just really, really abundant. Uh, these are the rootworms that corn growers use soil insecticides or Bt crops to try to control but they are still very abundant. They come to pumpkins to feed on pollen primarily. Uh, they don't really help a lot with pollination. They don't really hurt a lot with pollination. Uh, they don't transmit bacterial wilt pathogens, but they do in fact feed on the fruit. And you'll see lots of etching on the surface of fruit from corn rootworm beetles feeding on them. These beetles are around only in July. Striped cucumber beetle shows up first in April or May, lays a lot of eggs, does some transmission of wilt or just feeds on leaves, and then the adults die off. The next generation emerges again in July and August, maybe a little sooner in the south, and you can even get a second full generation in the south. So you'll get a summer flush or an early, and early summer and early fall flush in the south, of striped cucumber beetles again. And it is important to separate which ones are which because the striped cucumber beetles transmit bacterial wilt. And if you've got a pumpkin variety that's susceptible, you need to pay attention to that. Um, there is a way to sample for these that doesn't have you just uh, sort of walking through the field trying to say, which of those silly little yellow striped beetles was that that was flying away from the leaves as I was walking around trying to look at it? You may not feel comfortable that uh, you know which insect was there. You can use these yellow uh, sticky traps. Um, I don't think I have a reference in here for where to buy them, but if uh, Nathan and Kyle, if you want to write it down, it's simply Great Lakes IPM, company where we order a lot of insect traps. 
you can put these in fields. Uh, you put them out, look at them again two days later, um, and basically 20 striped or spotted cucumber beetles per trap in 48 hours is the same as one per plant. And so you can look at something where the beetles are stuck on a trap and not moving around, and it's a little easier to see who they are. Um, switch to squash vine borer. Again, these are wasp-like moths that fly in the daytime. We had the picture of them earlier on. They lay eggs on the vines. The larvae move to the base of the vine. They tunnel in, and they eat the, the uh, vascular tissue. And the plants will wilt and die. Um, in the far south, yes, we'll sometimes see a second generation. In the Galesburg area, uh, generally no, but the first generation can be spread out and quite a bit later. Um, can you do anything cultural to control these? Well, for cucumber beetles, we didn't talk about this because other than floating row covers, there's really not much you can do for cucumber beetle control that doesn't involve some kind of insecticide. For squash vine borer, you can. Um, and that would be for sometimes the crops other than pumpkins that you're growing that actually reach maturity and then sit there for a while. So if any of you grow zucchini uh, or yellow squash and you see some of those vines go down because of squash vine borer, don't just leave them there as dead vines because what you're doing is letting the insects that are inside complete their development, uh, find a safe place in the soil and pupate. So whenever you can destroy crop residue at the end of harvest, you're going to do some good. And that's even true in pumpkins, although they may have pupated. When you go through uh, with some kind of tillage equipment, you're going to kill a lot of them. Not all of them, but a lot of them that are still stuck in the vines uh, in late summer and fall. and even in the late fall after pumpkins are harvested. Um, how do you sample for these? Well, in general, uh, understand that if you had a problem you didn't control in 2013, you'll likely have a problem to contend with in 2014 if you plant anywhere in the same general area. They're, they're plenty mobile to find your new field. Uh, they're usually, for whatever reason, more serious in small plantings than they are in the great big fields that uh, Libby's or Nestle's plant over by the Mort Morton area. Um, and you can buy a pheromone trap for these. For those of you who know, you know, you can buy traps with a lure in it that attract the males of moths and you know when they're flying. The pheromone traps for squash vine borer really don't work very well. I think you're much better off to walk through pumpkin fields a couple times a week, look for these little red and black um, wasp-like moths. Uh, if you see some of them, look at the base of vines, see if you find any entrance holes in the early uh, infestations where there is frass or insect poop coming out of the holes, and that's your best sampling method. When you see the moths, if you are using conventional insecticides, uh, make a spray within about five to seven days after you see the first moths flying around. And then depending on whether you're somebody who wants to use as little pesticide as possible or you're somebody who wants to get as little damage as is at all possible, you can take two approaches. The sort of minimum approach is spray it once five to seven days after you see the moths and spray it again about uh, a week later. Um, and the sort of maximist approach is uh, do those and then make at least a couple more on weekly intervals. Usually you don't need that, but if the emergence is spread out over a long period of time, it's sort of cool and uh, the moisture doesn't make that much difference, but if it's sort of cool and it slows, lengthens their period of emergence, uh, you might need to spray more than twice. Uh, small scale gardener approach to this, yes, you can mound dirt at the nodes of vines, get some adventitious root growth out beyond where they destroyed the, the uh, base of the vine. That usually isn't very practical once you get beyond just a few plants. Best insecticides are pyrethroids, seven is moderately okay. If you're an organic grower, none of the products you have are really, really good. Um, pyrethrins or neem can do some good, and trust can do some good. That's the E-N-T-R-U-S-T product listed earlier. 
Uh, it's very expensive. You have to spray it a couple of times, and you have to get really good coverage of the base of vine. So this is something that the best way to apply in trust, if you're going to, to try to control this insect, is to go out with a backpack mist blower that really uh, puts a lot of air out with the insecticide and blows the stuff down to the base of the vines. Rick, I had a quick question. Yes, go uh, ahead. As far as go ahead. You talked about uh, destroying the uh, crop residue. Um, what would be some good ways, obviously, if you have tillage in a field on a smaller scale, could a, a, a grower compost? The, um, the vines, or is that not, or be better just to, you know, even maybe think of something more as burn them or something? Would on the, on the small right scale, yes, you're fine to compost them. If you build the heat you're supposed to in a compost pile, you won't have any, squa or any squash vine borer larvae or pupae survive. But I would say, yes, do that, and also go through it with a tiller, because the ones that have crawled out of the vines and are pupating in the soil, you'll disrupt and kill enough of them mechanically that it'll do some good. All right, thanks. Um, squash bug, basic idea, these things are going to find your field. Crop rotation does help. The further you put uh, squash or pumpkins from where squash or pumpkins were the last year, the better off you are. The adults do fly. They are not great flyers. They don't move long distances. But if you're a small-scale grower with just a few acres, you may not be able to move things far enough to really avoid them finding you pretty easily. Um, most folks do get them. It's just a matter of uh, did you plant squash so close to where it was last year or pumpkins that uh, you made it easier so you get more or did you make it harder and you uh, get less? What are you going to do? You're going to start looking for these things if you're in southern Illinois by the 1st of June, if you're in the north by the 1st of July. And you hope you go out and look a few times and never find anything because that means you'll find the first ones when, you, when they actually show up. Uh, so you're going to scout or monitor fields at least once a week, uh, probably twice a week would be better. When you find the egg masses, you don't wait to see the immatures. You say, if I've got more than, say, an egg mass per plant, if you don't like to spray, you might take a few more. Um, but an egg mass per plant, uh, as soon as I see nymphs hatch, then I'm going to make a spray because all the pesticides work best against the nymphs. For conventional growers, Brigade, Mustang Max, Warrior, Bathroid are the best. If you are an organic grower, you're going to go out with a pyrethrin plus neem, and you might get some good out of it. But you're far better off if you're treating when you see the tiniest of those nymphs than you are if you see the bigger ones, because they get harder to kill pretty quickly. Um, Another of these where if you destroy crop residue, that's better. Again, you know, when we're talking to pumpkins, most everything is done by the time you're harvesting pumpkins. But if you grow any of the other crops that support this insect, remember that when you quit harvesting zucchini because the vines went down, but they stay a little succulent for two weeks, you just provided food to let all those little nymphs become adults. And those adults will then be the creatures that overwinter and come to you next year. So, again, composting is fine. Uh, if you build up the heat you're supposed to in those compost piles, they aren't going to make it through. Um, again, thresholds. If you find these things on seedlings, you treat if they start to wilt. Uh, at flowering and later, you're going to treat if it's one egg mass per plant. And, yeah, you can stop yellow vine disease by, by using the sprays. So we talked about what works. Um, aphids and viruses. We're going to talk about aphid control to prevent population buildups. We're not going to talk about it for virus control. Um, all of the common viruses of pumpkins and the other cucurbits, not all, but the vast majority are aphid transmitted. And they're transmitted in what's called a non-persistent manner. The aphid is that causes a problem is usually not somebody that's going to colonize the plants. It's all these aphids that just sort of move through the air in the spring, especially in the late summer and early fall, again. Um, they are sort of drifting across the, the landscape. They can't fly upwind. They're sort of just drifting along with the wind. They land, they feed on a plant, and they say, yeah, this is the plant I'm supposed to live on, or it's not. And if it's not, they get back up in the wind and float down, downwind just a little further. 
when they land on a plant outside your field that's a host for a virus, say the nightshade family plants are uh, weeds, for example, are really good hosts for cucumber mosaic, uh, watermelon mosaic, mosaic, zucchini yellows mosaic, all these things. Um, they're going to pick up that virus as soon as they feed on that infected weed. They're going to drift into your field, and whether you've sprayed or not, they're going to feed two or three times. And if they don't like your crop, which 99% of them aren't going to stay on pumpkins, they're going to feed, move downwind a little, feed, move downwind a little, do it again. By the time you kill them after they've landed on your insecticide-treated crop, uh, they've fed two or three times and they've already lost their virus load. They can't transmit anymore. So what you get is perhaps a little sense of revenge. Uh, you can get even by killing them, but you can't prevent the problem they're going to cause. So don't get the idea that you should spray every week with something that will kill aphids because that way it won't get any viruses. It does not work. It costs a lot of money and it's just not going to be effective. Um, it's really hard to imagine how many aphids there really are moving through uh, the air in the spring and the summer, spring and late summer. Uh, we've put up these little nets that are three feet tall by, by 10 yards long along edges of fields and plucked aphids off. And you can walk along that net, walk from one end to the other and pick off about 10 or 12 aphids and turn around and go back to the other end and start again three minutes later and pick off 10 or 12 aphids. When you think about how little uh, area we're covering with that, it's billions of aphids floating along through the air. And there's a guy who used to call them aerial plankton. They're so numerous, they're just like all the little uh, uh, algae and microorganisms that are floating around in the ocean that fish and whales are feeding on. Um, they are that numerous some of the time. It's just amazing. And you can't control viruses by trying to kill them in your crop. Okay, um, what can you do? You use resistant varieties if they're available. Uh, other crops we can plant as early as possible, but you're going to plant your pumpkins according to when you need uh, harvest for jack-o'-lanterns for almost all of you. Um, you can sort of separate plantings even over just a few days. Some may be at a susceptible stage uh, when aphids are coming through and some may not. You're going to stagger plantings over a range of dates. Um, the one thing that's entirely impractical, but it sort of illustrates an idea, is if you could plant cucurbits in the middle of a weed-free crop that's not a virus host, for example, corn, you'd have plants that are the least likely to get any viruses. Of course, the only way we'd have weed-free corn here is if it's all treated with Roundup, and then you'd have a lot of Roundup damage to pumpkins. So it's not practical, but you sort of get the idea uh, that not having a lot of weed hosts right around you is going to help a little bit. Um, I don't think for pumpkin growers planting into reflective mulches is a very good, uh, very practical step, although you can do it. You can use row covers over a small number of plants or over plants when they're small at the beginning of the season to prevent early infection with a virus. So that can be helpful. So instead of reflective mulches, row covers can work. But as soon as they have to come off, you've lost that benefit. And as soon as pumpkins vine out and cover that reflective mulch, you've lost the benefit. So what a lot of people do is plant at the right time to get a crop off at the right time, and you take your chances. You just need to know that you can't start spraying the field with an insecticide uh, to prevent virus problems. As far as the aphids that build up in the crop, and this is an entirely different story, at this point you're trying to prevent those sticky, gooey, uh, sooty mold covered pumpkins at harvest time. No real thresholds, but what you're going to do is look in the field every once a week or maybe even twice a week. You say, do I find aphids? And if you do, you look to see whether or not there are lady beetles or whether some of those aphids are all puffy and pink or tan and look sort of like blown up mummies. That means they've got a parasite in them. And you look for those. You say, you know, do I have natural enemies or not? And you stick a flag in the ground in two or three spots where you've got these aphid infestations. You go back in five to seven days. Um, do you have any more natural enemies? Is the problem growing? Or 
uh, do the natural enemies seem to sort of uh, be keeping it down? And if you don't have the natural enemies, you got to decide to spray. Uh, but again, don't spray over and over again all the rest of the time because that's the best way to get aphid problems at harvest. Specific insecticides, take a look at the ones on the left side. Assail, Belief, and Fulfill are the products you could use in mid to late summer. Spray when bees are not active and they are the best aphid control products you can get. All of the other ones on that side are probably things that for reasons of bee kill or timing are not really appropriate. So assail, belief, and fulfill. Those are specifically products to control aphids. Of the general things you would use, the one product that's still out there in dimethoate, I'm sorry, it's not labeled on pumpkins, that's melons only, indosulfan is a fairly good aphid control product. It's being phased out by EPA, but until July of 2015, you can still use it. Um, the thing is with that, you really have to get good coverage because it's not systemic. And these other products, assail, belief, and fulfill, move a little bit in the plant. They move from the upper surface to the lower surface of the leaf, and they provide control. If you're an organic grower, neem plus an insecticidal soap would usually be the best combination of things to use. And again, you really need to get good coverage. So uh, for relatively small scale, an acre or two, you're probably better off with a really good backpack prayer, sprayer than a really old uh, row crop sprayer that just sprays stuff on top of things. So buy that backpack sprayer with a uh, mist blower so it's blowing out a lot of air and getting really good coverage. Where do you find the insecticide listings and just sort of the list of creatures and some general guidelines? Uh, 2014 Midwest Vegetable Production Guide will give you that. Uh, if you were to click on the link that's at the bottom of this slide right now, you'll still see the 2013 one, at least I did a couple of days ago, but really soon the link to that will take you to the updated version. It's free. You can click on pumpkins in the table of contents and get to just the pages that cover pumpkins. Uh, Kyle and Nathan, you'll not be surprised that I'll shamelessly promote the Illinois Fruit and Vegetable News as a source of information as well. It's free via the web. Uh, if you send me a note and ask for a subscription, we send you an email with a list of what's in the issue that's just come up, and we provide a link to it on the web. And there are some good newsletters in other states as well. Rick, I hear there's really good authors for that, that fruit and vegetable news. That yeah, that's the guys who write it lie to you about that. <laughs> yeah, I heard the same thing, though, so I don't know. <laughs> Okay, um, you'll have to explain that to everybody at each location, guys. There is a uh, good publication on identifying and managing pests of cucurbits in general. Uh, that one's not available for free on the web, but it does sell for $11. You can get it from uh, Pubs Plus from University of Illinois. So uh, this one covers a lot of cucurbit pest management in general. I want to spend 10 minutes right at the last here to do a quick job talking about neonicotinoid insecticides because I think a lot of you have heard there are big issues about these neonics and bee kill. So let's do a quick rundown of what they are and um, why there's an issue. I'm going to talk about some information that's in two or three different references. And I'm sure, if nothing else, Kyle could print off a copy of, of this presentation, and you can write these down from that printed copy. Uh, one is from a group of people at Purdue talking about movement of insecticides used in, in field corn uh, to places where bees are encountering them. One is about insecticide residues where cucurbits are treated with neonicotinoids, and another is just a broader view of neonics in general. So I want to tell you why this is a big deal. Um, nicotine is the compound on the uh, right side. Neonicotinoids are things that have at least a basis of a nicotine molecular structure to begin with. 
Uh, far more Actera and Platinum are the active ingredient thiamethoxam. Imidacloprid is Admire Pro. And a whole big load of uh, homeowner products. And Acetamiprid is a sale. Uh, so those are the ones that we talk about. And yeah, structurally they look about like, neonic like nicotine, at least in part, and they act in the same way in poisoning insects. Um, what are the major uses? A lot of seed treatments for corn and soybeans, soil applications for grub control in lawns, and soil applications beneath trees and shrubs and flowering plants in backyards to control Japanese beetle and some other insects. Seed treatments and uh, soil applications for control of foliage feeding pests in uh, cucurbits, including pumpkins. Uh, it's used in potatoes for Colorado potato beetle control. And a couple of them that really don't pose any problem, a sale and uh, calypso are used in orchards, but honestly, those really aren't presenting a bee kill issue. Um, why are these things an issue? They last a long time, they're really soluble, so they can move in plant liquids, and they are really, really toxic, a chunk of them are anyway, to bees. And it's odd that uh, we see them registered, but you may understand why because they aren't very toxic to anything else, and that led to a number of registrations. How long do some of these things last? Half-life means how long does it take to go from, say, 10 parts per million to 5 parts per million? And then the second half-life is to go from 5 to 2.5. So it's what's the decay curve for these? How long does it take them to break down? Uh, imidacloprid is admire. 40 to 1,000 days, if we use sort of an intermediate level, we say it lasts for at least a year in the soil with half of the initial product still there. Uh, clothianidin is the one that's used as a seed treatment in corn. It's called poncho in that use. Again, if we take sort of an, an intermediate level off that big range of 148 to 1,100 and something, it's 500 days. That's, you know, the bulk of two years. They last a long time. If you look instead at acetamiprid at the top, that's a sale that's used in apples for control of some key insects. It lasts for one to eight days. So some of them present a real problem for persistence. Um, they are all very soluble in water. Uh, the graph here is a little misleading. You'd say only dinotefuron or scorpion or venom is the trade name for it um, are really soluble, but in fact, Everything here is really soluble compared to most insecticides. For example, the old Lorsban product that was used in soil for a long time as a soil insect control product, also used in trees and shrubs. Uh, its solubility is about one part per million. Pounds or permethrin is half of that. And the lowest solubility in these is well over 300. So they move in water and they move in plant fluids. So they move from the ground into tissues. How toxic are they? Um, the higher the numbers here, the less toxic something is in the top part. And I'll tell you there are products out there with rat or rabbit LD50s that are in the range of 1 to 10 or 20 or 50. So these have very high numbers. It means it takes a lot to provide a lot of mortality in these test animals. So the neonics are not very toxic to people at all, which is why they were appealing for regulators to register. They are, in fact, not very toxic to birds. And compared to insecticides in general, that PNT on the bottom means practically not toxic. It takes so much that nothing would ever get that dose. They really don't present much risk to birds or fish. But then you see bees, and it says acetamiprid or a sale is moderately toxic, and admire and uh, thiamethoxam the, and clothianidin are highly toxic. Uh, how toxic does that mean? Now, you don't have to be uh, a toxicologist here if you just bear with me for some numbers. You look at acetamiprid on the top, and it's a lot like thiacloprid or calypso. These are a sale and calypso. It takes 8 point something to 14 point something micrograms per B if we dose them directly. Clothianidin takes 0 
micrograms per bee. That's the poncho product that's used as a seed treatment in corn. Imidacloprid, 0 0.0037 micrograms per bee. That's Ed Meyer that's used widely in ornamental uh, plants and turf. Those are roughly, folks, 2,500 times more toxic than acetamiprid at the top. So when we say acetamiprid is moderately toxic, not a big deal, and we say clothianidin or uh, imidacloprid is highly toxic, we're not talking a little, little bit of a step up. We're talking way, 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 way more toxic. That's where the issue is with these products. So the folks at Purdue did a study about how pesticides used in corn or field crops uh, get to bees. And without reading you everything, basically they're saying the seed treatments used on corn uh, because of the nature of uh, commercial corn planters these days, we're talking about uh, uh, grain corn, commodity crop corn, uh, they are very precise pieces of equipment, but they are using air to suck up and drop a seed and then expel the air and then grab the next one. So it's a vacuum and an exhaust. When they do that, this talky material that includes the insecticide, some of it is exhausted in the dust and it's moving downwind onto plants that are flowering at that time and onto other surfaces. It's also still staying in plants so that you can find some of that product in the flowers, meaning the silks and the, the, the tassels of corn. And so there's a big concern about the fact that these seed treatments are reaching places they shouldn't and that they're killing bees. This is especially important for the guys who have crops that are flowering when corn planting is going on, and that's the folks with orchards, with apples and peaches that are in bloom, often about the time people are making all those, making their, uh, doing their corn planting. There's another study, though, that comes out of work done on cucurbit crops, and this was with cucumbers in most cases. But basically, let me skip their abstract and go to the summary imidacloprid or other neonics used on cucurbits uh, were found in pollen and nectar and leaf samples from pretty much all the plots where they're used. If they're used really early as a bedding tray drench or if they're used as a seed treatment, they're producing very, very low residue levels in nectar and pollen. It's probably not an issue. If they're used later on, so not in transplant water or bedding tray or whatever, but instead later on as side dress drenches or as sprays, which product can be used in that way, much higher rates in pollen and nectar. And so we can have, you guys can be the culprits here. If you're using these products late on as pumpkins begin to get close to bloom and then later during bloom, you're moving some of it into pollen and nectar. And uh, the, the final statement from these folks, from Galen Dively, who did this work, and he's a very experienced, very good applied entomologist in vegetable crops, said if neonics are needed for insect control in cucumbers, they are in cucurbits, this would include, pump, include pumpkins, they should be applied at planting or shortly after to get control of cucumber beetles or squash bugs if they're present at that time, but not later for aphid control because the risk to pollinators is too great. Um, you could go online and look at, just Google this title, are neonicotinoids killing bees from the Xerxes Society? And their comments are fairly straightforward, but they include a table that uh, I want to point out to you because it really reminds you that this isn't all an agricultural issue. Uh, take a look at all these trade names of products uh, for imidacloprid. The ones in the third column, Admire, Gaucho, Imicide, etc. All these are trade names for products used in agriculture. All the ones in the right hand column are trade names for products available to homeowners. And I want you to look at the third from the last in that top right square. Ortho bug be gone, year long tree and shrub insect control. Does that suggest problem to anybody? 
If it lasts a year, don't you suppose it's poisoning something we don't want it to? And if you're using it on trees and shrubs where it moves into the flowers, does it present a problem to bees? These products are out there, and they are an issue in the urban landscape as well as in agriculture, and they last a damn long time. Otherwise, they wouldn't call it year-long tree and shrub insect control. And that's an issue I think we should have learned not to let happen from all the days of DDT and Aldrin and Dieldrin. So suspect some regulatory changes on those products. Until then, if you are growing pumpkins, realize that especially Admire Pro, Actera, the Poncho seed treatments, that that's not ones we're using. Uh, for us, it's going to be a different product. It's going to be the far more seed treatment. These products are okay if you're using them in cucurbits very early on as seed treatments or transplant drenches, but don't use them later. And expect to see some regulation of all these seed treatments that are on uh, field crop seed corn. It's just going to happen. So that's the end of what I had for you. Um, so, Kyle, Nathan, and anybody else, questions? Uh, Rick, we had kind of one uh, kind of quick question it was brought up, you know, how you uh, talked about that seven isn't very effective on squash bugs. Do you have anything that especially may, you know, maybe a smaller, even more homeowner side or someone maybe on a very small scale could get a hold of that would control, especially if they didn't have a restric restricted uh, pesticide applicator's license for, for squash bugs? Yes. Uh, now, realize two things here. As soon as you buy one of those products in the, uh, you know, Farm and Fleet or Rural King or whatever, and you buy one that says not for use on commercial crops, uh, you're not supposed to sell what you put it on, okay? Uh, so if that's not an issue for you, yes, you can buy products there, and you can... Uh, the ones that you'd look for would include Lambda Cyhalothrin or uh, Cyfluthrin or Bifenthrin. And what I would do is say to, to both Nathan and Kyle, if you have a copy of the, uh, what do we call it, the Home and Landscape Pest Control Book, you know what I'm talking about? Uh, the one that Phil Nixon and group put out every couple of years, it has a list in the beginning of it of the trade names of all these active ingredients in products that are available to homeowners. Well, as non-restricted use homeowner products that you could use on, on pumpkins. Hey, Rick, I typed in that question for you. Did you read it? Right. Right. Um, basic answer no, you're not going to have a problem. Uh, the type, the, the uh, question Kyle typed in was, if you keep seed from a plant that was treated with a neonic, how long or will the resulting seed pose problems via neonics? For example, seed from an heirloom variety. Uh, it should not provide or present any problem. Um, I don't think you're going to see the stuff move into seed in any amount and you certainly wouldn't see it move in at an amount that would be an issue when you plant that seed and it grows out the next year. And I'm going to sign off, guys, so uh, best wishes for the rest of it. Thank you. I might also mention, too, that uh, if you're in a small area, you don't have a whole lot of acres of pumpkin, the best control for squash was to put some sort of a, a board or a shingle or something like that on the ground. Every evening, squash bugs look for cover. So go underneath those boards or that, or that shingle. Next morning, you go out there, turn the board over, and squash them. It's a lot easier to spray. If you don't have acres of pumpkins, that works fairly effectively. How much would you need to put out? Just put a board, a 2x6 or 2x12. Well, it depends on bigger areas. Thank you.